Welcome back. In this session, we will discuss onboard computing. I will explain you the differences between devices and provide a few examples. Processors are around since the dawn of the personal computer. The focus of processors is on computation. Processors typically require peripheral integrated circuits to be able to function. They need, for instance, work memory and data bus controllers. Processors are the fastest for generic computation. With generic, I mean that it serves a range of applications and not just one specific. It can, for instance, calculate the outcome of an equation, but it can also be used for logic operations like, if this condition is met, then do this and else do that. Both calculations and logic operations are typical functions of an onboard computer. The typical average power consumption of processors is between 10 and 150 watts. In the picture, you see a 386 processor. Although this processor was introduced in 1985, a radiation-hardened variant is still being used for the command computers in the International Space Station. Flight heritage, decades of mission design and the radiation environment are typical reasons why such ancient devices can still be seen in currently operational large and expensive spacecraft. Microcontrollers focus on embedded systems. The difference is that they typically have less computational power than processors. However, they have integrated memory and other peripheral functions. Think of analog to digital converters, pulse width modulators, data bus controllers, etc. Also, their average power consumption is much less than processors, typically well below 1 watt. There are nowadays even microcontrollers which consume less than 1 microwatt. Comparing state-of-the-art processors with state-of-the-art microcontrollers is comparing apples with pears. A state-of-the-art microcontroller, however, is more has more computational capacity than the 386 processor, which was shown before, and it does so at several orders of magnitude less power. Since the need for computational power for many spacecraft functions has not grown as much as processor speeds, there is a trend in the space sector to, to move towards microcontrollers, especially for smaller spacecraft. A field programmable gate array, or FPGA, is an integrated circuit with reprogrammable logic. You can design your integrated circuits in a programming language. It is not the easiest language, but the overall process is easier and more cost-effective than designing regular integrated circuits. You can even buy or download so-called intellectual property cores which are building blocks for FPGAs with specific functions or even complete microcontrollers. FPGAs are relatively fast and low power for specific functions. However, an FPGA IP core of a microcontroller consumes more than a regular microcontroller. The European Space Agency has developed the Leon microprocessor family. This is an IP core which can be integrated in FPGAs. It can be combined with controllers of, for instance, the Spacewire bus. It has many failure-tolerant logic inside, such as redundancy of critical functions, as well as intensive error detection and correction mechanisms. This microprocessor is becoming very popular at the moment for modern spacecraft. Now let's take a look into the future of onboard computing. We can go one step further than FPGAs with application-specific integrated circuits or ASICs. An ASIC is a complete integrated hardware solution for a specific application. It is basically designing a new chip. However, you can also use IP cores for specific functions similar to FPGAs. However, the circuit structure can be optimized to be as fast and power efficient as possible. The disadvantage at this moment is that it takes more time and costs you hundreds of thousands of euros to produce an ASIC. I do expect, however, that in the next 10 years, devices will hit the market which can produce ASICs fast and cost-effective, just like you can now let your printed circuit board be produced for less than 100 euro. ASICs with many different integrated functions combined are so-called system-on-chip, or SOC. However, SOCs 
can also integrate generic applications, like a microcontroller. SOX can even go one step further and integrate sensors or microelectromechanical systems within the chip package. You can therefore see them as the smallest complete systems. Maybe this one day may lead to a complete satellite on a chip. Now we take a look at a few examples of the onboard computer of several spacecraft. We already discussed the International Space Station. It has been around for a while, but it still uses the very old radiation-hardened 386 processors. The Spirit and Opportunity Mars rovers of NASA use a radiation-hardened BAE processor of IBM. This processor is radiation-hardened. It can run up to 25 MHz and costs about 200,000 euro. Our own Delphi C3 and Delphi Next satellites use an MSP430 microcontroller of Texas Instruments, running at 8 MHz and costing only about 2 euro. It is, however, a microcontroller intended for terrestrial applications. The Gochi satellite, which might be familiar if you have followed the course on Earth observation, uses a radiation-tolerant ERC32 processor from Atmel. This processor is discontinued and evolved in the Leon microprocessor family of ESA. The JUICE satellite going to Jupiter's moons will use a Leon 2 microcontroller, while the Ariane 6 launch vehicle will probably use a Leon 3 microcontroller. What is worth noting is that ESA already released the Leon 4 processor in 2010, while both JUICE and Ariane 6 are planned for a launch in 2020. You can learn from this that the space industry is rather conservative and lacking behind the state of the art once it concerns major missions. There are several reasons for that. But most important one is that you cannot replace a faulty device once launched like you can do for terrestrial equipment. Also, the cost of a spacecraft is orders of magnitude higher than, for instance, your mobile phone or car. Last but not least, the launch and the space environment is harsh. In the next session, we will learn more on what this harsh environment and the lack of maintenance can do to your spacecraft equipment. Also, I will provide you some examples on how some of these failures can be isolated and recovered. See you back after the exercises.